wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming to another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Today, we're going to be exploring. You ever thought that maybe gardening can improve your life? You know, maybe going out there in the garden and doing some of that green stuff with your green thumb can uh, make your life better? Well, I don't know. That's not this kind of show. This is a show where we have great authors on. So <laughs> welcome to it. Thanks for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com for just Chris Foss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all those crazy places the cool kids are playing. Our big LinkedIn newsletter. Subscribe to that as well. Also, go to youtube.com free for an unlimited time. You can go there and subscribe to the Chris Foss show, but you want to grab it until that unlimited time runs out. Uh, today, we have an amazing author, as always, on the show. Brilliant mind that's going to expand your mind so much that it'll probably improve your sex life. I don't know. The attorney said I can't say that anymore, but I got in there anyway. Uh, Avram Alpert is on the show. He's a multi-book author. He's the author of the newest book out April 19th, 2022, The Good Enough life he must be describing mine or wait mine's the horrible life but his book is called the good enough life and he's going to be talking to us about what's inside of it and uh, what he found in his research he is a writer currently based in hamburg germany where he is a fellow at the new institute uh, he's the author of several books and of course this new one welcome to the show avram how are you thank you so much i'm doing well how are you Thank you for coming. We certainly appreciate having you on. Uh, give me your plugs, your dot coms, where people can find you on the interwebs. Uh, so I have a website. It's just my name, avramalpert.com. I am a uh, amateur Twitter user. I'm not there very often, but uh, you can find me at Avram Alpert. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the main places. And then just, you know, scattered around. If you search Google, you'll find things I've written through the years. There you go. There you go. So uh, just tell us what motivated you to want to write this book. Well, um, I think I was just sort of looking around at, at a world where you had so many wonderful, talented, caring, committed human beings, um, and you had uh, so much um, capacity and, and possibility and, and, and so many good enough humans, good enough ways in that sense that we're all flawed, but also we're all good mm. so we'll have the capacity good and also right we deserve enough we deserve to have kind of sufficient uh means in our lives um and when you looked at the world you saw that in spite of all all of our good enoughness among among all human beings um some were doing fantastically well uh some had more than they could ever use uh and you know billions billions of people right we're living in, in poverty millions dying of hunger every year millions dying of lack of access to health care um, and I wanted to understand how it was that the way that we thought about life and its purpose might be contributing to that. Obviously, there are many factors, there are structural factors, economic, and so on. Um, but there's also just a way that we think about the world. And I think sometimes we sort of say, well, there's the, the most talented, there's the best, there's the greatest among us out there. And if we, we give them more, uh, they'll make the rest of our lives better. We have this kind of trickle down vision of everything. But what happens is actually you just give them more and sometimes our lives get better, right? Sometimes they get worse, but in the process, we're not kind of focusing on ensuring this good, goodness and enoughness for everybody that I think we all deserve. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to explore that idea in the book. I look at it in how we kind of treat ourselves as individuals, how we think about our relationships, how we think about politics and society, uh, and how we think about our relationship to nature. Um, but it was really just a book to kind of, it was like a, it's a plea uh, for making a caring and decent world that really works, you know, well for everyone, but not perfectly because you know, life isn't perfect. What is the concept of good enough? Is it is that we need to kind of I don't I don't know if the right word here. Some people might use the word settle. Uh, it, 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 you know, we live in a world, and I, you may address this in the book. Uh, we live in a world where you know everybody lives their lives based upon what's on Instagram. I mean, there's people that are unemployed that. <laughs> And out of work and are probably unemployable, actually, at that point, who are, you know, they go borrow some clothes or I don't know, they go to the store and pick up clothes. I know 
I know there's some people that go on a date so they can take pictures at nice restaurants and they have no interest in the date. Uh, you know, we live in this kind of Instagram world. You know, the joke is that uh, when the archivists die, dig us up years from now, they'll be like, wow, everyone in their whole everyone was smiling in their society it was really weird they never frowned at all or cried um so is that is that kind of uh what you talk about in the book so i don't deal so much with social media though i think for mm -hmm. sure it is a it is some is a force in our lives that really asks us to to excel right you know because you want to show that okay i was at the best restaurant or i took the nicest picture or look here's you know, i know the most famous person or whatever um, but there is also, I mean, I think there are potentials in social media, some of the kind of original things that attract a lot of people to it, that it wasn't about what was amazing, right? It was about what was ordinary. You know, you'd get mm -hmm. to see your friends um, having a picnic together and you'd sort of feel nice about that. And I think more mm -hmm. and more it's become like, oh, my friend just, you know, got this re reward or whatever. Right? We sort of try and show how, how good we are um, as opposed to sharing these kind of just nice moments in our lives. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea of good enough, I mean, Settling has a couple of meanings too, right? Settling can mean this kind of, well, I settled, you know, I didn't really want to take that job or whatever, but it was what was there. And, and that can happen. And that's part of life, you know, that is some of our imperfection. Uh, but settling can also mean kind of having a solid base, right? Having a good, happy place. You know, you really, you're settled, you're feeling comfortable. I think it's more okay. that, that sense that I'm, I'm interested in. Okay. Um, the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so you know the one of the problems with the instagram thing is people are just feel they never feel good enough you know they're they're like oh i've got to keep up with the joneses i've got to keep up with margie and margie's bought the latest you know rodeo drive hollywood bag of whatever your name your designer um i've got to go get that too and it, it's it all has that uh fomo effect what we call the fomo effect the fear of missing out it's like oh I've got to keep up with the Joneses. Um, so is there a point where we just need to set that back then and say, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe what I have right now is good enough or is it gratitude based at all? Yeah. I mean, look, some of it is uh, part, part of dealing with FOMO is recognizing you're always going to be missing out, right? The nature of life is there are multiple possibilities and you only have one you. You can only do one of them. And if you try and do too many things, right, you, you ultimately miss out. And that is the origin of the phrase, right, good enough comes from, from a psychiatrist named Donald Winnicott, uh, who talked about the good enough mother, good enough parent, good enough caretaker. Um, and the idea being that, uh, you know, when, when you have a child, probably, hopefully at some level, right, you want to, to be really good to that child. And in fact, sometimes you want to be too good to that child. Right? You want to give them everything. You don't want them to experience pain. You don't want them to have uh, problems. Um, and Winnicott's point was, when you do too much for your child, you actually start to take away. Yeah. Because you're taking away their understanding that life is flawed and can be difficult and we can't get everything we want. And, and it's from that childhood experience, he thought, that we become creative, we become adaptable. And so it didn't mean that we should then, you know, just be mean to our children and have them fail all the time, right? But that we should be good enough to them. Right? Mm -hmm. we, should, we should give them, you know, love and care and affection and we should provide them with material and, and emotional support. Um, and so there's the, the, it's not, the good enough doesn't mean you settle for whatever it is. It doesn't mean just, yeah. okay, life is like, terrible right now but whatever i guess you know it's good enough it's not going to get better no i mean it really has to be both good and enough and 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 those metrics are things you know we all define for ourselves um but they're you know within some some limits right there's a limited number of resources limited number of attention um if we're taking too much for ourselves we're keeping other people from from having enough so it's trying to get that that balance right that's good advice note to self start being good to the kids uh <laughs> now um we talked about this yeah. yeah i'm glad we i'm glad we did i mean if my father taught me you just give daily beatings whether they deserve it or not just just so they you know they keep in line um and uh you know i mean cps seems to have some sort of problem with it anyway we do the jokes around here um <laughs> the uh it's like a never mind uh, I could just keep going on with that joke range so uh what are some details you help us try and understand how to how to embrace the good enough life um so i think there are ways to do it at, at different moments right and you can think about it for your yourself uh one of the things that i think about some in the book is you know how do you think about good enough in your relationships because i think one of the things you, you hear when you think good enough is you hear settling right like i couldn't mm -hmm. find i couldn't be with the person i really wanted to be with so i kind of settled and it's good enough 
Um, but I really wanted us to think, you know, what would it mean not to chase the, the perfection, the, the perfect person who doesn't really exist, right? This is just not something that we're, we're complicated creatures, we're moody, sometimes we're tired, sometimes we're cranky, right? No one is going to be perfectly seamless or, or ideal together. Uh, but what you want is someone with whom, you know, you kind of share uh, some values, right? You share kind of a sense of what's good and what matters in life, and you can kind of build that together. And also that you're enough for each other, right? You really are there to provide that kind of emotional support. You're caring, again, with your children, same, same basic idea. Um, but also that you can appreciate each other's flaws, right? So that you're really not looking for, okay, I want this person that I'm with. They have to you know, do everything right. And if they mess something up, like it's just going to be a disaster and everything has to kind of fit this form. You're going you're gonna to drive yourself, your partner, right? You're going to kind of drive everyone crazy. Um, so there has to be, again, there has to be a threshold here, right? At which point it's, a, it's abusive, right? It's not okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. not good enough. Um, but beyond which it starts to also have kind of detrimental effects uh, when, when we pursue too much. Um, you know, and, and then one of the questions of the, of the book is really, what can we do to think about this in society? You know, how, how can we think about it such that uh, what kind of systems will make it possible that everyone, you know, has, has more or less what they need? Um, and we live in a society that that's not really the goal, right? That's just not like explicitly how we think about the world. We think, okay, if we get, again, the best people to have the most, it's going to benefit the rest of us somehow. It's a weird idea, right? It's, I mean, I, I think of it like imagining, um, you know, you have a hundred fields and you want to figure out how to irrigate all of them. So you put all the water in one of them. And it's like, of course, the water is just going to stay. It's not going to spread around, right? You really need to kind of make sure that, that everyone is getting something and feeling like they can grow and they can flourish and, and they can be, become the, the, the people they are with whatever talents they have, uh, whatever capacities they have. Um, and so, I, you know, I try and think through some of the ways we can do that in society. You know, I don't have a perfect solution here. I hope I have some good enough ones. Uh, but that's that's kind of what I'm encouraging us to think about. How do we do this for ourselves? And then how do we kind of bring the values that we want to see, the kind of ordinary care, decency, joy, pleasure, the things that really make up a life? And how do we make a world that makes that more possible, more likely? So it sounds like you talk not only on the personal level, but you talk about maybe doing an, uh, a, a, a world uh, sort of view where we all decide that, hey, we should maybe approach something in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think a lot about, for example, about cooperatives, right? You know, the, instead of designing businesses that are really geared towards, um, let's get the, you know, one person is going to invest all the capital and they're going to make all the money, right? We're all going to kind of go into this together and maybe, you know, maybe one person puts in more time or more energy. And, and so, you know, we can have some, some small differences. Maybe they make a little more, they get more vacation time because they put in more at some point. Um, you know, that's fine. But like, how do we, how do we kind of think about what kind of models will make it easier for us to all experience a, a good enough life. Um, and there's other ways in which this happens, right? It's not just money, right? We're also talking about attention. You know, mm -hmm. when, when you write a book, it's really great. I'm, I'm, I love talking to you. I, I really like doing these podcasts. It's really nice. But, you know, there's so many good books published all the time. And sometimes yeah. what happens is one author, you know, you see them on every show. They win every award. Um, is their book so much better than all the other books? Probably not. I'm sure it's, it's always, you know, it's usually quite excellent. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, it catches something. It has a good publicist. There's all sorts of ways that this these things play out. But when we soak up attention like that, right, we kind of lose out on, on some other ways of thinking or other ways of understanding the world. And so the hope is that if we think about how do we, what you know, how do we limit that kind of attention economy, right? How do, how do we think about attention as a resource that needs to be shared and spread? Mm. Um, and so that, you know, I try and talk about that, that as well in the book, you know, and so one, one, for example, one thing I'm really interested in is lotteries. You know, mm. So instead of having kind of selection committees, who just kind of, you know, this was the best book of the year and everyone else said it was the best book. So we'll say it too. You say, look, here's, here's a hundred amazing books that were written this year. There's no way to really, you know, these aren't like things we can put on a scale. Um, let's put them all in, whatever ones really we think are beautiful and, and wonderful and, and well articulated and see which one comes out and we'll give that one the prize or we'll give hmm. all of them a prize. There's a hundred best books this year. Go crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I try and think through some of those things in the book as well. That sounds pretty interesting. Um, it does in, in, in the world that you're suggesting does Instagram and Facebook and all the FOMO sort of apps, uh, still reign or do we have to, do we have to put those away? I don't, you know, I, it's an interesting question um, because I don't I don't go so much into it, and and you might have a, a better answer for this than I do. But I did read some interesting studies recently, and I'd yeah, be happy to hear more about it. But I read Let's some, do. yeah, like that that some of the some of the 
what happens on something like Instagram is very similar to what happens in the economy, which is that there are a few influencers, like a small percentage of, of Instagram, Twitter users, um, TikTok, whatever, like soak up the vast majority of likes, of views. Um, and again, right, we're having an attention economy that's really just showing kind of small parts of it, which is, you know, so I, sometimes it's nice, right? There's something kind of nice, like, oh, we all saw that same funny video, right? And Charlie mm -hmm. bit my finger or whatever, you know, like that everyone kind of saw it and we could kind of laugh about it. But on the other hand, right, what got what got left out in that process? What kind of other things got, got lost along the way? What kinds of cultures of um, iniquity or cultures of distrust um, what kind of ways of feeling kind of jealous or angry resentment? What kind of things are we building up in, in what appears to be pretty innocent? Just, okay, I'm just sharing this photo or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I think if we don't think seriously about attention and its distribution, um, we'll, we'll have people feel really left out, really angry. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot of the kinds of problems we see today. Yeah. That, that kind of sounds like uh, you describe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Why we're having problems now, you know? I mean, everybody seems more unhappy than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, for some people, that happiness is the, re the reflection that they get when they go on social media. And they're like, well, you know, Bob's got a new car. and uh, I don't. And so I suck. And Bob's clearly winning at the new car game and life game. And so uh, I'm going to be depressed and go drink a bottle of vodka. Or something, you know, I don't know, whatever yeah. the thing is. Um, I do that on Wednesdays. Uh, I really, I, I really follow Bob, and you know, Bob makes me depressed all the time because Bob's Bob doesn't drink vodka evidently on Wednesdays, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, is uh, what, what's what's a great way to get in touch with knowing if we're living the good life, uh, the good enough yeah. life, and yeah. and uh, balancing, you know, in our mind, like, hey, it's okay that. Maybe Bob has got the new car. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things, and, and again, some of it's going to be what you can do individually, and, and some of it will be, you know, what you do in terms of how you think about the world you want to live in, your your politics, your social arrangements. Um, there isn't exactly because life is dynamic. If you live in a different right, if you live in the Northeast, you need heat in the winter, and if you live in the South of the United States, you know, you need you need air conditioning in the, in the summer. Um, the kinds of things we need are just not going to be exactly the same. So there isn't a, a simple, straightforward metric. But we can say, look, you have to be able to feed yourself and, and you know, whoever is dependent upon you. Um, you need to have housing, right? You need to have health care. You need some education. You probably need work or, or some kind of material means of sustenance. Um, and then you also need, right, kind of things that make your life feel meaningful, right? You need other kinds of sufficient support. So you need, you need people who care for you. I think you need to be able to care for other people, right? Part of what makes life feel meaningful is that people also right, depend on you and, and you can be part of that. Um, you need to have something that makes you feel fulfilled, whatever that might be. And I mean, if something that makes you feel fulfilled is making other people feel terrible, then we need to talk about that. But assuming that your fulfillment comes from your, your pursuit of your passions and your interests. What if my fulfillment is making other people feel terrible? I mean, that's yeah, no, I mean, then then I think we need to sort of say maybe that's not a good enough thing. I mean, it, it's, I, it makes me feel good enough. I mean, isn't that? But it's a, it's exactly what you said, too, before, right? So it makes you feel good enough one time, but then not the next time. And then, yeah. no, it depends um, on who I'm making feel bad. <laughs> Yeah, no, I feel I feel really bad now, Chris. I don't know. I think I need to see a psychiatrist for narcissism or something. I don't know. No, it's, uh, I think, I think, so, yeah, assuming, assuming, right, that there are, pathologies that we have and there are ways that we are cruelly sometimes knowingly and sometimes not um and those are things that that will make our lives not be good enough right because we'll constantly yeah. be in conflict with other people uh we'll feel in conflict with ourselves um and and working those through is something that provides that kind of goodness so you know if you're if you're finding that that you're you're kind of feeling like well this person has like this kind of shiny object that i want you know you can look back at yourself well do i have what i need do am i having a, mm. a like do i have meaning do i have decency do i have purpose I have all these things in my life. And if the answer is, and, and you know, you have enough to get by, like if the answer to that is, is yes, then it doesn't particularly matter. Um, if though, right, we're looking at say the boss of the company has, you know, a helicopter and he's paying you five fifteen an hour and you can't afford to eat, then, then we're not talking about jealousy, right? We're talking about a political problem. We're talking mm -hmm. about someone who's really exploiting you. And so that's, that needs to be 
discussed and, and addressed. Mm. Uh, so it's a difference between, you know, the kind of minor, some people have more material objects, whatever, within a certain range. I don't think it's necessarily a problem. But when it is, right, that, that's, that other person has that thing because you are being impoverished, right? You're doing the labor, but someone else is taking it. Um, that's, that's when I think it becomes a different kind of concern. There you go. So uh, note to self, to be good enough, stop exploiting other people, Chris. It's a great idea. Yeah, I just, damn it. I I have so much fun, and that's actually my good enough. But uh, uh, I excel at that one. (laughs) There you go. Uh, What are some other aspects that you think you you should tease out in the book that people, I think, will find uh, interesting? One of the things I think that's really important is that um, we are, of course, natural beings. Uh, We Mm. require an environment to sustain us. We don't live in a void. Uh, We need food, we need water, uh, we need clean air. Um, So our environment is good enough to sustain life, right? The natural world is not perfect. It's not endless. It can't just take everything we throw at it as as much as it would be nice if that were the case. Um, It has its own limits and thresholds and and conditions that, right, we are pushing uh, drastically. Um, not just in terms of, of carbon emissions, but in terms of biodiversity loss, in, in terms of the regeneration of natural resources, of water, of trees, of uh, minerals. Um, we are putting too much, you know, kind of particular substances, nitrogen, phosphorus in, into the, the soils. And um, all of this is having, you know, cat- potentially catastrophic effects. Uh, and it, we've already seen some of these, right, with, with changes in, in weather patterns and droughts and so forth. Yeah. Uh, fires. And so, right, remembering that good enough isn't just about our own lives, but right, the lives of the, the world around us and, and developing um, developing an appreciation. Again, I think one of the things we sometimes think or I've seen people say about climate change is that, you know, well, the earth is so big, like it's just so vast and the heavens are endless, like there's no way that, that this is what's going on. But it is, right? It's, it, this is just not a perfect system. It was not designed for this, um, it wasn't really designed at all, but it wasn't right made in, in this particular way, um, and so we need to to respect and and care for that. So that's you know the kind of end of the book deals with those questions. And again, one of the things I think we see when people are cognizant of this issue, though, is they say, well, you know, what we really need to do is get the smartest people together, and we'll have them invent these like technical contraptions and these like amazing tech devices. They're going to suck the carbon out of the air. They're going to come with these new kinds of electricity and. We absolutely need and, and, and have many amazing technological inventions and innovations, and I think that's wonderful. Um, but that, that is also not really enough, right? There are just mm-hmm. you know, limits to how much we can um, consume and take without thinking about regenerative processes. So there's, I think the Earth's ability to sustain human life is amazing. I mean, we're doing it with eight billion. So far, wild, yeah. So far, so far but exactly like you said, right? It's so far, and so uh, we're not going to get some kind of quick technological fix, right? We really need to invest in all of us, and and mm. again, we need to make these situations that are good enough for everybody. So it's not, you know, people talk about a just transition, right? That it's it's not just that, okay if you work, uh, you know, pe- the real genuine people, right, whose whose lives are dependent on cutting down trees um, or farming with pesticides. Or, or oil extraction, right? We need to think about how these people can really transition into something that is more sustainable, more renewable. Um, it's not about throwing some people or some industries under the bus. It's, you know, how do we do this all together? You know, you may lose your 16th home in uh, Las Vegas if you're Damn in it. or whatever, you know, but yeah, exactly. Sorry, Chris, we're going to, you know, you're, you're losing your 16th house. But look, like, 15 again. Yeah, what but look, you know, you'll be able to breathe the air. I think it's a good deal. Mm, breathing 16th. Think about it. <laughs> uh, so this is pretty insightful, and you know, I think it's I think it's time where we, you know, we used to live in a world where it was good enough. We we had the good enough boyfriend or girlfriend. We had the good enough. Um, you know, I like I see. I, you know, I I'm. At 54, I've been single all my life, and I date, and I see these lists that people make when they date. You know, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and, and you know, some people have like a hundred items on their list of what they're looking for, as if you can order people out of a freaking catalog, which you can't. Last time I checked, unless you, I, I think, unless you order like a Russian bride, then you can maybe get that out of a catalog, but that's, that's, that's probably gonna good. not end well. Yeah. It's probably not gonna end well. They usually don't. Um, but. Uh, 
Uh, although I don't know, I can't say that. I don't know that as a fact. It could be. It could be well, like it's, somebody, it's somebody's human trafficking. I think we do want to yeah. avoid. That's true. Yeah, it's well, we don't want to get into yeah human trafficking, but I think some of the rides legal. I don't know. Well, anyway, it's if we do the truth. To do you know people want to do things? That's fine, but it's all you know. They're being forced yeah. into it. But it's yeah, very it's different. Lovely, it's lovely. Yeah. We do the jokes around here, people. That's what we do. We set up uh, weird scenarios. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, we used to be a good enough society. Like people would start relationships with somebody. I always meet these people and they're like, I want that love affair of that old couple that's 100 years old. They're holding hands walking in the park. And you're like, well, you're 45 and you haven't settled down with anybody. And they're like, I haven't found anybody good enough. And you're like, well, what's your list? And they're like, I have 100 items on the list. And it's like, you know, I'm pretty sure that when that old couple met, like when they were 20s, you know, he came home from World War II and she was, uh, you know, helping out with the wartime effort on her end. Uh, you know, uh, what were those uh, Riveter Rosies? And you know, they met and had kids. They didn't sit around and go, well, I'm not sure if you meet my hundred, you know, list. And uh, they just said, you know what? Uh, we kind of like each other. We seem pretty good to each other. And let's see where this freaking goes. Mm -hmm. And they stuck it out. And, and, and a lot of people do that in this world too. They trade, you know, divorce rates are off the chart because everyone's always trying to trade up and everyone's like, oh, well, maybe there's something better out there. You know, one of the problems we have with social media is, is a lot of people get, you know, hit on DMs, especially if you're married, and they're like, hey, you're really hot. You shouldn't be with that dude anymore. And they're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't. And it uh, looks like the world's so much funner out here. And then they get single, and they're like, this isn't as fun as I thought it would be. And now mm -hmm. my children are bastardized. You know? What am I going to do? So, you know, it, it, we really need to get back to some of the things you're talking about, I think, in this book. Mm. No, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things I found reading this book was a, was a, I think he's a sociologist named Paul Amato uh, at Penn State University. And, and he says that it's kind of fascinating that people who divorce um, when they remarry are more likely to divorce. Like the, the divorce rate for first marriages is like 50%, but the second marriage is like 70%. Yeah, it's like 67, 70. And then it goes right. higher after that. Yeah, it keeps going higher because part of part of what happens, right, is that you know you divorce because not be, if you look if you divorce someone because you have a problem, you have a really bad relationship, it's abusive, or it just you really you've really changed in some way. That's you know that happens, and and I think that's okay. Uh, but if you divorce because you think oh like I really want the perfect partner, and my partner is like eighty three percent good, those almost always you you never gonna find that person, or you'll find them for five yeah. minutes. You know, like the first month, you have a honeymoon and it seems like it's going to be great. But so I think, you know, what what he says in, in his research is that the, the best you can really, there's really nothing better than good enough. Right. Um, there's nothing better in which you, you know, you have a meaningful, supportive, emotionally caring, sustaining relationship in which you kind of enjoy and appreciate each other's company. Um, and that's, you know, that's good enough. And that's actually, that's human life because of course people are going to get on your nerves and of course people are going to change and they're going to want different things. Uh, you know, there's a point at which, right, it becomes abusive. It becomes problematic. Of course, then divorce is absolutely what you should do or, or whatever. You mm -hmm. For various reasons, people do these things, but, but if it's because you're searching for the perfect partner, you're likely to just keep searching your, your whole life. Um, yeah. you know. And yeah, I just, I think that the, the, that is part of lots of things that we do, right? With the way people raise their children as well can also be, you know, you really are pushing so hard, you know, and, and it's totally understandable, right? You kind of look at a world where you can either excel and kind of be at the top of the social hierarchy and, and have money and have comfort, um, or you can kind of fall and really feel like, I'm, I don't know where my next meal is going to come and where my next job is going to be. As you hollow out the middle class, I think some of what you're you know kind of pointing out here is that as you don't have a place to project yourself into, okay, I can have a meaningful, decent life as a teacher, as a librarian, as a as a police officer, as a custodian. Um, I can have a good union job and, and make life work. You start to there's all sorts of stresses that come to kind of filter out into that, and then it affects how we treat our children, how we treat our partners. Um, that's not to say, I mean, obviously sometimes we romanticize the past when it wasn't always so good for women or for people of color, and then you know this. Uh, continues in various ways today but there was i think some some of this that that you're describing there was a kind of solid middle class that you could live an ordinary decent life and 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 that's you know beautiful um yeah it's it's uh it's uh 
you know, it, it, people, people, you know, I think they, they see so many other people have stuff and there's so much of it that's faked. Like it, it's amazing how much it's faked. Like, like I said, I know people that are unemployed and unemployable who, you know, they have all those best pictures. They look like they're going places. Um, you know, they even have places where you can go to now where you can take a picture of you uh in looking like you're on a private plane and it's really just a cut out of a plane it's like a scene set up and you can go pretend like you're sitting in the chair of some private plane zipping off to dubai and turns out you're just you know it's just a stage set (laughs) so and 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 it's interesting people get caught up in it and they um and they believe it's true or they they have to keep up or else they're they're falling behind or something uh-huh. I don't know. yeah yeah no no and again, i mean i i i agree with you you know entire, that a lot of this is kind of media saturation a kind of propagandistic thing um you know i do think it's important to say as well that sometimes you know it's not untrue right so my my profession you know i, I write and i teach um and there are fewer and fewer kind of good teaching jobs and so you do start to feel this pressure like well if i'm not being the best at what i do right i'm not going to be able to make like if i'm not the best podcaster if i'm not the most charming you know if I don't, whatever you say in your intro the, the minds that are just going to you know, change everything forever um i'm not going to make it like i'm not going to be able to do to do the things that I'm, I'm good at or that i care about um and so i think you know the more that we can think about how do we have a society that makes it possible for people to pursue what they're good at in meaningful ways and again, lots of professions that are not glam, you know, like being an elementary school teacher, being an aged care worker, being a custodian, all, you know, um, being someone who, who collects the garbage in a community, like all these things are things that make our lives, all of us, right? We contribute to society's meaningful ways. And if we're not making it possible for that person to, to have a decent salary, to raise kids, to send their kids to a good school, to have somewhere to live, to have health care, to have education, you know, the basic things that, that, that make life Feel, feel meaningful and decent and connected, um, we're going to have problems, right? We're going to have people really kind of fighting each other, trying to get to that top. Um, and and uh, it's not going to, it's not going to work. It's going to tear us apart. And again, I think, I think we're seeing that very clearly um, that we live in a world that is really fracturing. It's holding together, you know, but the, the <laughs> it's not working out so well for so many people. And, and I think if we don't start to transition in these kinds of ways, to really think about a decent, caring life for as, as many people as we can, um, we're going to keep having these pretty drastic problems. And that's not even thinking about the, the nature side of it, right? So. Do do politicians need to take this then into account more? Like, do they need to maybe think about this as a political sort of, uh, you know, thing that we need to do politically? I mean, I'd love if they did. I'm not a, um, I'm not a slogan writer, probably good enough is like not the best rallying cry. I mean, I like it, you know, I'm, I'm totally into it. We don't have jobs. We'll just have good enough people. Yeah. Well, It'll enough. just it's be not... a TV yeah. dinner on every <laughs> table instead of a uh, turkey yeah. or something. Maybe a little, little, you know, TV dinners are the plastic. It's a, it's an ecological disaster, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't so I don't know what the like the best way to phrase it you know what what that sounds like you know as, mm-hmm. as someone who's trying to think about this kind of philosophically as a writer I, I found the Winnicott's phrase good enough parent really resonated with me and, and I was happy to use it and, and play with it you know for a slogan I don't know but I do think the basic idea right what what should we do as a society it's not about us finding like the best the most talented and giving them everything and like hoping they work everything out for us it's about all of us being involved and, and living these kind of decent lives and, and appreciating that there's some struggle in that and there's going to be some difficulty in that um, but we're going to be in it together and literally like actually together not this like we're in it together but i'm on my private plane or whatever we're in it together but i'm on a giant yacht um, no we're actually we're actually in this together because we all are contributing and caring about each other and that's our focus as a society so i'd love to have that be the political rhetoric um, instead of this kind of divide and, and conquer rhetoric that we we hear so much which is really about, you know, like you are the deserving ones and other people are not. And, and mm. it'd be much more beautiful to really hear, no, look, we, we, this is what it means to be human is, is we all kind of care about each other and we're helping each other. So I'd love that if, you know, if you or someone else comes up with like the perfect political message for this, that'd be great. Um, I'm happy if people want to run with good enough, like, you know, uh, that's great. But um, there has to be some something to carry that, that message of decency, care, these uh, um, material well-being for for all of us, and knowing that again, 
it's only it's never going to be better than good. Like we're going to have to deal with some problems. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Well, this has been an interesting, insightful discussion, and definitely we need to realign our values and everything. Uh, I think that's really important for us to take and do. Uh, give me your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. Uh, if you want to find me, the easiest thing to do is avramalpert.com um, or at avramalpert on my much underused Twitter accounts. Uh, I'm currently at the New Institute here in Germany. You can find me on their website as well. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be in touch. I like hearing from people. I, I respond to most emails unless they're really mean, but otherwise I'm, I'm pretty easy to talk to. <laughs> Those are the mean ones are the best ones. Maybe you're better. I'm, I just kind of like, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, so uh, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it, Avram. This has been pretty insightful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really fun. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Go order the book, The Good Enough Life. Uh, came out April 19th, 2022. Uh, you can get it wherever fine books are sold. Go to youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reading over there. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. And uh, all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and all those crazy places the kids are at at the end of the days. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys 